Genesis chapter 3. Last two classes, well, particularly the last class, we were talking about the difference between God's creation and ours and what we specifically meant by that was not just, you know, the first creation, which we call the earth and all of that, and then God's creation being the new creation. <clears throat> all of that is true and real. <clears throat> but we were also including in that just the thought that this, this terrible reality that is true, and that is that man has created his own creation, what he calls civilized, civilization, and <clears throat> None of it is after the pattern of the Lord. I say none of it, but I mean, basically, it's, it's according to man's understanding. It's according to man's wisdom. And so we get caught in that maze. And that maze could be a mousetrap. It is a situation of uh, being hostage to society hostage to the way that we have set things up. And I'll, I'll explain that more as we go. And <clears throat> But I want to start with sort of a little bit of background where that all began and where it started from. And in Genesis 3, we have the fall of man. And, and originally, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And one of the things that made the Garden of Eden a garden at all was that they had the privilege of meeting with God in that garden, of talking with the Lord in the cool of the evening, the Bible says, communing with the Lord. And their explanation of reality was coming from God himself. They weren't feeling around and, you know, in the garden and making thoughts and decisions in that sense, their minds were like a blank chalkboard. Their spirit was like that. Their soul was like that. And the information highway was not the World Wide Web. It was God's heart to man. And God not having to fight um, all the blockages, all the preconceived ideas, all of the wrong ideas, all of the self-focus, all of the hindrances that is man, <clears throat> he simply spoke his word and his heart. But as you know, man fell, and in Genesis, Chapter 3, beginning with verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity <clears throat> between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And as you know, women don't have seed. <clears throat> except in the form of what's brought forth from them. And that seed is Christ. The seed of the woman was Christ through a virgin and through the bride of Christ. <clears throat> and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in and thy conception in in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto, the, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herbs of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt 
thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of it <clears throat> wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. And say that. I was going to give you a little line from a physicist, but I, <clears throat> my goal isn't to put down physicists. My goal is to lift up Christ. <clears throat> so here we have the thought. So try to follow this. That God originally created everything, and he had a plan and a thought for our lives. And how that pattern would flow. Now, it would make sense that the author of the book could explain the book. It would make sense that the mechanical engineer that created, that's what I call, instead of calling him creator, I will be referring to him more as mechanical engineer in this <laughs> physics class because that's literally what that is. When we say creator, we automatically go, oh, somebody, but we're talking about the guy who, who, who is many other things besides mechanical engineer. But the mechanical engineer knows what he built it for. He knows the purpose, how it should go, and he knows what's, what is completely, horrendously, terribly off, left field from what he had in mind. Okay? And so... Um, so there is that reality that a shift took place and that shift was out of purity of God's idea of creation and where things were to go into sort of saying okay well you know you're, you're now in a fallen state and you're going to create your own creation you know <clears throat> And, and by the sweat of your face, it says, you'll bring forth bread. You'll bring forth bread. Okay. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting. Because the way that this other creation began, the very beginning of Genesis, the be Genesis means beginnings, the very beginnings, Adam was tempted by the devil. Right? And we know the results. And we, and we not only know the results of a man that failed, I don't think we know the results. I don't think we comprehend that all of this is the results of that. I don't think we understand that the, the strain and the pain and the agony and the, the hurt and the torment and all of the things that we go through, many of it based on a creation that we created and formed, that won't go the way we want it to go, that is frustrating us, but we're in bondage to it, so we can't leave, so we pray that God fixes it. Anybody get that? <clears throat> Been wanting to say that for a while. Just pour that out. Trying, thinking that God exists to fix a broken civilization. What would you, system. And the only thing that's civilized about it is we made it and we think this is the way it should be, so we call this civilization. Now, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but because everything within me in this study, I, when I got into it, I saw from mechanical engineering to sociology to uh, uh, quantum physics to astrophysics to uh, history, 
across the board principles that fit here and here and here and here. And this country, American history, this country, we got over here and it took us no time. This was a pristine country, untouched. And man, it didn't, you know, it didn't take us a good hundred years to sweep totally across, cut, start cutting down the forest, start killing off everything, and setting up civilization. We called all that progress. Well, that's, you know, and we built all of this. And we think this is progress. Let me tell you, even though it was hard for the pioneers and stuff, there was something good about living off the land and working together and, you know what I mean? And not being gone all day and, but, you know, and working for something that you cared about and that, you know, there was, there was something about that. And, and drawing those things, you know, you didn't go down to Home Depot and get your stuff. And I like Home Depot. But Home Depot, you know, is not the answer. You may. With all of the people lined up that don't like me, now Home Depot just got in the line. <clears throat> um, all right. So I'm trying to make a point here, and that point is we're making a bridge from Genesis, the beginning, and how everything went up till Matthew, the beginning of a new covenant, a new relationship, and a new guy taking charge, and that new guy comes on the scene, and right here, the, the, he, he steps out into ministry, he goes down into the water of baptism, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove on him, which Adam never had, and immediately, that dove, that spirit, takes him out into the wilderness, or, yeah, the wilderness, there it is, to be tempted of the devil, just like the beginnings in Genesis. Whole process, starting all over again, but with a different head. A different head. <clears throat> Then was Jesus led by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Well, we, you know, we comprehend God in relationship to our civilized world and way of thinking, and therefore God would never lead you out to be tempted what he does is he makes it where you're totally safe from temptation. But God doesn't do that. He, he empowers you with a life and nature called Jesus so that he can put you in any situation and you can overcome, but only by Christ. Can I get an old me? I mean, amen. But only by Christ in you, the hope of glory, nay, rather, Christ in you, the hope of every situation you come in contact with that you can't handle, which should be everything. <clears throat> All right. But there's more. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards hungry. All right. How many of you have fasted 40 days and 40 nights? Raise your hand. 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. Well, since you haven't, let me ask you this. Do you suppose if you had of you'd be hungry? <laughs> then let me ask you this. Do you suppose if you were hungry, do you suppose that if the first sign of the devil, he came up and started tempting you about food, that there would be an actual temptation? You see, it's not like Jesus just went out in the wilderness and the devil showed up. Jesus is throwing gasoline on the fire by not eating. And so what does the tempter say? Verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, remember that statement because that came from Genesis where he says, you know, from the sweat of your brow you shall have your bread. 
But, verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. All right. So here we are. See, I got goosebumps right there. Here we are. We are back at the original place of temptation. We are back at the original place of direction. The crossroads of all that God had in mind. Will we make our creation or will we go with God's? <clears throat> and Jesus makes an astounding statement. Now remember, soon, very soon, probably before this class is over, we're, we're going to talk about the loss of all. And I can look into some of your faces and see that you lost it a long time ago. All right. So, here we go. <clears throat> Jesus says, uh-uh. No, devil. I am not of that civilization. I am not of that creation. <clears throat> and here he says it. Man shall not live by bread alone. Shall we say it like this? <clears throat> Fallen man lives by bread. But there's something more. Something more. Something beyond from Adam's fall till today, all men had worked by the sweat of their brow just to eke out their living in this earth. But I got good news. There's something more beyond bread. And you can't live by just bread alone. You can only exist. You're not living. That is not living. That is existing and fighting the elements of the thing that, of the monster you raised up. I say you, mankind. And Jesus is the first one who breaks the fallen pattern and says, no, there's something beyond this civilization. There's something beyond this creation that you've created, this thing that you've laid out. And man can't live by that, by this thing alone, you know. <clears throat> All right. Let me read some notes or we'll never get anywhere. God ordered that fallen man would live by the sweat of his brow. <clears throat> Burden is upon him. He is made to work hard for his bread, yet we're told by Jesus that man shall not live by bread alone. This means that even though bills must be paid, Work must be done. Bread must be provided. There is still a pursuit that is for those who will live beyond being a fallen man. Something beyond bread. What is the difference between the plowman and the ox if both exist and do what they do simply for food? Is there more than bread? Did you catch what I said? If, the, if you're plowing your fields with an oxen and he's, you know, don't muzzle the ox, it treads out the grain. Amen? You're familiar with that? So he's got this bag of food and he's working to bring forth the grain and you're pushing him to bring forth the grain. Then what makes you any different than an ox? Your motives are the same. Your work is the same. I mean, he's slightly, he's pulling a bigger load, but I mean, you're right behind him, walking in his poop. Is that it? I mean, that's my, that was my point. Is that it? Is that, is that it? Is this it? I mean, surely somebody somewhere plowing with oxen thought, you know, this is stupid. There's got to be more than this. <laughs> really? I mean, they got, you know, I mean, this ox, he just eats and poops and sleeps and then works to bring forth this stuff, this bread, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> no. They just keep right on working. 
and thinking this is the way it's supposed to be, doing what the man tells you to do, and tote that barge and lift that bale. And so here, Jesus comes along. He said, uh-uh, homie, don't play that. <laughs> there is something beyond this, and I am not bound by it. That's where you're going to have, and, not, and my, a, whole, a whole lot of this whole thing on quantum physics and astrophysics and everything is to bring a whole other angle of seeing that we're going to have to see beyond what we see right now. And that's really, I mean, God has proven it to me over and over in these, in these subject areas. And <clears throat> therefore, logical deductions by drawing conclusions from given facts is not an awakening. And what I meant by that is we're going to have to see something different, but we keep coming to logical conclusions uh, uh, drawing conclusions from given facts and we get the facts we get we're getting the information we're getting the information we're getting the facts and we are drawing logical conclusions but that is not an awakening there's no awe there's no wake in awakening <laughs> It is just drawing logical conclusions about facts. Well, yes, amen. Glory. How, how do we used to say that, Mike? Praise him. <laughs> praise him. You know, does that sound like praise? Does that sound like heartfelt? Oh, praise you, Lord. It's just like, yeah. Oh, glory. That's good. <clears throat> Men simply glory in the achievements they have brought about simply by utilizing the laws that already were there. Science and discoveries should give us clues as to yet undiscovered realities that rest in God who gave the hints. Those are all hints. When we get into get a little more into this, I don't know, maybe maybe tonight. I'd love I'd love to get into it tonight. I spent today writing quite a bit uh, that I'd love to just get into that because I'm full of the matter, <clears throat> but we may not make it that far. <clears throat> um, astronomers see wonders unto the most distant galaxy, but they do not see God. Yet every particle reveals him in function and in Wonder. The heavens declare the glory of God. So the greatest discoverer would be one who saw God and looked through the lenses of that knowledge into the universe or into the universe of quantum physics. <clears throat> We're talking about astrophysics, looking into the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God. All right. You can, and physicists primarily use mathematics to explain things. You know that, right? You know. By the way, Einstein was not very good at math. It's a fact. He just was But I think he had an, another eye. You understand what I mean? He saw beyond math. And so I wrote, the mathematical formulas only explain by mathematics what astronomers see. But there is a spiritual spectrum of light that is unperceivable to the naked eye. <laughs> Hallelujah. The purpose is not to stimulate higher intellectual facility, faculties pertaining to facts of nature, things that we didn't know before, but now, oh, look, microwaves, this kind of wave, this, this, oh, my God, now we can have cell phones. And that's it. That's the awe. That's the glory of the moment. 
The purpose is to declare God and in so doing to open our eyes to him and his majestic workings and person. All right. Well, I didn't get into the all part, but I'll do it. I'll do it now because that sort of explains. <clears throat> Let's see. I had a statement over here. The zest for life has been replaced with being about the existence of the business of existing. The zest for life has been replaced with being about the business of existing and maintenance. Do you know a whole lot of life is just maintenance? I'm talking about our life, not God's life. It's not like God has to mow the universe. <clears throat> Just say it. It's not like he has to go clean up the stardust or any of that kind of stuff. You look, there's a wonder to it. It maintains itself. He flung it into existence, and by his power it goes, and there it is, and it works. This earth was the same way till we touched it. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. The glory is gone because in our minds... We have pretty much discovered it all. It, that's in our minds. You know, we're a legend in our own mind. <clears throat> we have lost our innocence. We've lost the wonder. Beauty does not move us. Poetry is worthless. It's all about need and gain. And here's what I mean by that. It, there is, there, you know... <clears throat> I had a man who was an elder in this church say to me once, um, why did God make a rose? It's pretty much worthless. I mean, you know, there's no, he, he said, I'm a pragmatist. You know what that means, right? I'm practical. I'm, I, everything has to be practical. I'm a pragmatist. Why the heck would you make a rose? Well, you know, the guy happened to be married. I wondered how that was going. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I didn't say anything because I wanted him to finish. I wanted to hear this stuff. But it was all about need and gain and working toward a goal. And oh, those goals were all tied up in our little world that we created that has made us hostage to it. <clears throat> Poetry is worthless. It's all about need and gain. Essence leaves us unsatisfied. And here's what I mean by that. I speak a lot about essence, and most people don't even have a clue what I'm talking about, nor do they care. And you know what they say? They say, oh, all that floaty stuff. There, you know, I don't really have time for that, which, which is true. This life has got them so bound up, they wouldn't have time to seek beyond, you know, a 10-minute sermon or, or read something real quick or whatever. Essence means nothing because you can't grab hold of it and start utilizing it instantly. That, you know, physicists are totally consumed with trying to find the essence of things. And so are many other things. Christians, I, I have found, are not near as asking as many questions and is seeking as deeply as sociologists or, 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 or physicists or whatever because we think we've already attained. We think we've already got it. My God, our lives, the shape of the church in this world ought to declare something to somebody that we still, we still have a need. There's more to this. <clears throat> We start out correctly, meaning we were alive and everything was real, right? Alive, that's a good one. <clears throat> we, but, but to get back there, we must surrender our position as general manager of the universe, meaning being in charge of everything. <clears throat> Education has increased. More people prosper. We have more of an orderly life. And yet, 
people can't see beauty around them because they're not, their awe is gone. Their awe is gone. And, I, I, and, and so, you know, in trying to explain this, I'm using tangible examples of God's creation and whatever. But what I'm trying to say is, whether it's the physicist or the Christian, if you lose that indescribable awe within the thing, then your life becomes orderly and mundane and dull, and you just do what you got to do to get the job done. And what is it that you give your attention to? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's how you, you there, there's, no, there's no principle, there's no ordered life in God. It is simply this. When that squeaks, next, I go fix that. I walk until I, oh, this is squeaking now, I go fix that. that the, you know, well, what about, the, what about the faithful wheel that never squeaks? Amen. Sorry. <clears throat> the beauty of the butterfly and the rainbow are the same to all. But not all are in all, and I'm trying to make a spiritual point. The the butterfly doesn't change for one person to from another. They all see the same thing. A rainbow, you all see the same thing. You, you see what I'm saying? It's just that some, and, and I'll get into exactly who here in just a second. <clears throat> we may love knowledge, but do we have the knowledge of love? Meaning. Are we ordered by an essence from within, or do we just love knowledge? The, and that essence for, within, does it guide us? Now here's, here's an example trying to help us to see it. I'm just trying to help us. I'm trying to break some crust off of some people. A man in prison will find great treasure in one sunbeam. Or just to hear one little bit of music is like heaven. Taste is more acute to somebody who's hadn't eaten hardly anything. Thankfulness is more forthcoming. But what if the prisoner built the walls, enclosed himself in them, and declared that this creation is good? <laughs> then a sunbeam means nothing. And the sound of music means nothing. I wrote behind that, what if the prisoner built the walls and closed himself in them and declared their creation to be good? I wrote next, we are all madmen. <laughs> in prison, you cannot eat cars or cell phones. They seem unimportant. A sunbeam may mean more to you, <laughs> you know, sitting in a dark, damp cell, rats and roaches, it's dark and everything, and all of a sudden the sun, after years of being in there, somehow, some way, a, one sunbeam comes into that cell, and you just, you get over in it, you let it fall on your face, you just soak in it. can almost taste it. <clears throat> if we cease to delight in the things that bring true nobility, then we have lost our way. We have died to true beauty. And, and I, I'm not going to get into that. Maybe I won't even in this whole course. But the title or the, or the, the title of nobility for me is living free by Christ, according to the Lamb. It is a nobility that few recognize, and yet it is royal. I, as I said, I probably, it is, it is the heart of part of this that I was seeing, but I don't know that it's going to take us in another direction. <clears throat> the sense of all, to explore a rose beyond the biological facts. Because you can, you can look at it biologically and study it. To smell, to, 
to taste, to feel its petals, and to see its poetry. And I, I again, I'm speaking of more than poetry or roses or da 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 da. I'm speaking of a sense that man has lost, even in relationship to God and the things of God. To lose this, it cannot be regained by accepted logical deductions about it. And that's part of my point is there's a line. And when you cross that line, it's very difficult to get back across that line. You settle in. You, uh, you know, the example I've always given is if, if, if fallen man, if Adam, if, if somebody dug a deep hole in the ground deep and, and threw Adam in it, he would eventually get in there and he'd soften the dirt and make a little sway place where he could lay back and he'd dig out him a little shelf and stuff like that. And, you know, he's all about his own comfort. <laughs> if, you, if you cross a certain line, yes, you can, you can come back, but it's so difficult because we fall into patterns that eventually control us. They direct us. They hold us. They push us. They hold us down. It's true. And you know what? I could almost share this anywhere. I could not say Jesus and go to a a businessman's meeting that wasn't Christian at all. And many of those guys would go, you're right. If not all of them would go, you're right. You know, when I started my business, I was happy, but now my business owns me. <clears throat> there is a rest and there is an awe over the light of life. When it is truly received as the light of life, it brings a certain rest and it brings a certain awe within you. Is there awe over reading the multiplication tables? No. But that's, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to use examples, that's sort of the spirit that people have fallen into over reading the Bible. it's almost like reading the multiplication tables. And then just going, da, 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 da. one wants two, down to is four, four and four is eight, eight and eight is 16. And then somebody, somebody stands up and says, eight and eight is 16, and we go, yeah! Glory to multiplication. When, when our inner reaction is nothing more than well said, well said. Thank God we have a well-sayer. <laughs> you know, God has blessed us with a well-sayer. Oh, he can say it. Is there, is there all over reading the multiplication tables? They are true and helpful, but do they change us? Do they touch us and make us sing or cry? <laughs> well, they make me cry, but not in the way you would think. <clears throat> However, a mother's touch, there's not a practical explanation of how it relieves or removes our problems in a practical way. When I was a little boy, I remember I would have nightmares. And um, I would wake up in the middle of the night. We had this fireplace going in the living room. <clears throat> and I mean, it'd be 3 in the morning. And I'd wake up, and I'd just go sit in front of the fire. And I didn't want to go back to sleep because I didn't want to have those nightmares. And the nightmares were from the junk that I, you know, <laughs> the trauma of <laughs> living in that house. And so I didn't want to. I hated those nightmares, and they just scared me. And so I'd just sit there, and I'd look at the fire, and you know, start getting sleepy. And you know, oh no, I can't go to sleep. Freddie will get me. Uh, and my mom would come in. I don't know how she knew I was in there, because I would not. I was a. I'm a very quiet person. My dog doesn't even know when I'm coming. 
ever. And, but somehow she would just know and she'd get up in the night and it didn't matter if it was 12 or one or three or whatever, she'd come in there and she'd sit down on the floor beside me. She'd put her arm around me and she'd say, is it those nightmares again? I'd say, yeah, and she said, well, lay your head over here, it's gonna be all right. She didn't do anything <coughs> But her touch and her voice, I would just, I would just go to sleep. And sometimes she'd literally pick me up and put me back in bed, and I'd wake up the next morning, and go, "How did I get here?" Last thing I remember was sitting there with mom. <clears throat> Can we see? Man shall not live by bread alone. Can you see my explanation, what I'm trying to communicate here? There is something beyond the natural. There's something, there's a sense of awe that can do things. And I'm just using these physical examples that are physical examples of a spiritual truth that is even greater. Are you, are, am I getting any of this? Across? There is this wonder. There is this incredible awe. There is this whatever it is. And that's the, the, the beauty of physicists. They say that a lot. <laughs> I, I can see it. I can see phenomena based with it. But I don't know what it is. Uh, dark matter, dark energy, you know, all of this. Have no, even black holes, you know. <clears throat> so... Uh, logic plays no part in, in a mother's touch. Practical daily use of math does not elevate our lives. It causes us to function easier in this life, in this world, in this creation. I mean, God created math, and yet when it's all said and done, it comes down to one, even three comes down to one. When it's all said and done, it comes down to one. The whole world, what is cyberspace? The whole world of cyberspace built on what? Zeros and ones, that's all. <laughs> you know, it's not one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, it's not heavy math. Zeros and ones, completely, totally all of cyberspace. It's, folks, it has grown to such a degree, they should rename it Cyber Universe. And yet that universe comes down to either, you're either zero or you're one with the one. <clears throat> and that's true in physics. There's always an offsetting. If there's matter, there's antimatter. If there's a particle, uh, if there's an a, a electron, there's a, a proton. That's, but I'm, I'm just trying to say, you don't have to understand all that. And my goal isn't to get you to understand physics. My goal is to just use examples that are proven in the creation of God who created all that stuff and show that they are bearing witness to the glory of God. Answers as to this life are not the whole truth or the end of the need for truth. Answers in this life, in our creation, in our realm of, oh God, fix my car. My, my, my truck broke down this week. Been broke down for over a week. Is that, is that tough? Yes. Is it tough to function in one car when you live out in Crumb, Texas? Yes. Is, is it the end of the world? No, you know, I'm sure all of you heard Jason and Nisi had their baby, Camille, everybody got that? Okay, yeah. So I had to make arrangements to get out there because I didn't have a car and Deb was already in town, you know. Those are just things you deal with. Those are not your life. Your life is Christ, Amen. you know. Um, well, don't you feel bad locked in that upstairs with nothing but your Bible? Not really. No, not really. Because it's not an upstairs with a book. It's a 
It's a, or a what? <laughs> it's a realm of the Lord that I, in him we live and move and have our being. If that becomes more than a mathematical scripture, you know what I mean by that, don't you? A mathematical scripture meaning it's just an equation rather than a reality, rather than an all-bearing reality. And there's no explanation. Well, you know, you've seen it. You know, I've seen it with married couples. One person, they are bursting with life, and the other one's going, why do you, why, why do you act this way? What are you getting out of all this? I don't see it. You know, I don't get it. Well, I can't explain the all part, but Jesus, you know, so we start saying things. Jesus died on the cross, you know. And for the person with all, they go, my Lord, can you believe it? And the other person goes, well, why would he go do that? What's the, what's the point of that now again? Well, you know, we had sins. Oh, he died for our sins. Yeah, so you ought to owe him. Therefore, you ought to receive him and then be happy about it. That's, that's what the gospel comes down to in many places. Because they, 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 there's no all left. There was an awe in the Garden of Eden. All was new, alive, and ready to be discovered. <clears throat> but man was driven from there unto a world of labor and burden. Unto what? Unto a world of no awe. Unto a world where you could simply work out and figure out mentally. But all you're going to work out and figure out is build your own little world. And that world is going to control you before too long. It's going to control your time. You're going to say, I want to do something for God. And it's going to say, you can't. You have this, this, and this. Now, I, you know, I know it's not true of everybody here, but I can tell you there are people here in this fellowship that have set their life in such a way that they can be available to God so that God can say whatever he wants to and they want to be able to go. You know, Abraham lived in tents. God said, you know, he was living in this one place and he said, move over here to Hebron. So he packed up and he went over there. He didn't say, well, I built his house. And for years, this is absolute truth, for years we lived in mobile homes. More, I don't know now, but most of our early life, raising kids and stuff in the early going, we lived in mobile homes and I wasn't ashamed of it. Trailer trash, trailer trash. No, that's not a trailer, that's my tent. I can move, I can move the darn thing to another city if I want to and still be okay. You know what I mean? Whereas the opposite of that is, I'm sorry, I can't. I mean, if God's moving in so-and-so city, I can't go there. I mean, I've got this house. That's what, you know, I used to joke when I worked for Denton State School, you know, uh, because it was a, a short period in my life where I was under control. And people would say, well, you know, da-da-da-da, why don't you come da-da-da? I say, well, I can't. I got this job. <laughs> Did you have your hand up? I think there's not a one of us that haven't felt that or experienced that or it's just have we lost it you know and and let me also make make it clear we're not talking about just doing things in an exciting emotional way <laughs> okay we're talking about all I mean all in the scriptures sometimes the all of God hit somebody um, and they couldn't do anything 
They couldn't speak. They couldn't dance. They, could, they just were like, you know. Uh, I remember Daniel. Daniel saw the Lord, and he fell down and got sick, threw up. That was his response. You know, I remember that. Yes, sir. Amen. Uh, let's see. You know, let's, I am so close here, but <clears throat> no. I think I think we're going to take a break, and I'll come back. Uh, the only reason why I hesitate is because I'd love to share the things the Lord shared with me today. Just love to be able to get into it. But if we don't, we don't. So let's take a break, and we'll come back.